welcome. We're glad that you've joined us for worship. Uh, we're in the Advent season, as you can tell, and uh, we're in a new series. Uh, you can see it's entitled here, Who Is He? It's the, the question we want to answer here. We want to discover who God is uh, at this time of year, this Advent season, and who is the son that he promised to give uh, through Mary and Joseph? You know, uh, in this first reading of Advent, we uh, read from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, and I just want to remind us of that. This is 700 years before Christ was born, roughly, and in that prophecy, Isaiah says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are what are known as the throne names of Christ in this 700 year prior to his birth prophecy. So the idea in discovering who is this child, uh, it's to discover through these throne names, those characteristics uh, in Jesus that God demonstrated through different uh, characters in the biblical narratives. So we'll be looking at characters like Mary and Joseph. Uh, we'll be looking at the shepherds. And tonight we're looking at Zechariah and Elizabeth. For some, it will probably be a familiar story. For others, you'll need an introduction. But I'm so glad that you've joined us. Let's dive right into scripture here together. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter one. And we'll be looking, starting at verse five, at this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth to see just how God reveals himself to them to answer that question, who is he? Starting in verse 5 of Luke chapter 1, we read, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. So we learn a few things right off the bat about this couple. They are both from a priestly lineage. Uh, they're both very faithful to the laws and commands and decrees of God. This is a couple found faithful, also found with one distinct problem found childless. Now, in a, a priestly lineage, the very one important thing to continue in that line would be a son. And Elizabeth is unable to conceive. And apparently, as the text is telling us, they're past those childbearing years anyhow. But what is going to become of a faithful pair from a priestly lineage with this very problem? How is God going to show up and reveal just who he is? Well, we're going to learn here in just a moment why God handpicked this couple to be involved in the very story of bringing this Messiah into the world and how a son of their own will be intermingled with that very great plan. But the thing is, Zechariah as a priest, there's two things probably very much on his heart. Longing for the redemption and the salvation of his people, Israel, and waiting for that day, but living in the midst of Roman rule. So God apparently seems to be not in charge, not on the scene, because the Romans are the ones ruling this government. His other problem, as I mentioned, not having a son. I imagine Zechariah, a faithful priest, with a prayer on his heart for these two items. Lord, I long to see the redemption of your people. 
please allow me to see it in my day. And maybe he had long since given up on a prayer for a son, but perhaps there was a time where he was desperate on his knees and saying, Lord, we're helpless. Only you can accomplish this. Well, let's pick up the story again here in verse 8 of chapter 1. We read there, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So imagine this. There's roughly 18,000 priests serving in first century Israel. The chances of any one particular priest from one of the 24 divisions among those 18,000 is very slim. And here is our man, Zechariah, chosen by lot, indicating that God's hand is upon this choice. A man with a problem. He's old and he has not yet seen the redemption of Israel. He's old and he does not yet have a son. But he's chosen for a very esteemed position to go into this temple to burn incense. This would happen two times a day. And this was the duty of the priests who would come to Jerusalem for a period of two weeks. And uh, he would be with a team of other priests. And so it's not something he would get to do every day. But on this particular occasion, it was his turn to go in and burn incense. And their job would be to take the sins of the people, as it were, and as a priest, represent before God the offerings for sin and in this case, burning incense. It's as if the reality of a psalm like this, Psalm 141, comes true in Zechariah's very task at this moment. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You know, incidentally, this uh, incense offering that Zechariah was chosen to burn, it's described in very fine detail in Exodus chapter 30. The, the entire reason that the Lord wants them to, to burn this twice a day, very specific instructions for how to do it, and very specific ingredients that go into this whole process. What you'll find if you were to read that entire chapter as something that ought to jump off the page at you, this altar of incense is overlaid with fine gold. This incense, one of the primary ingredients, was frankincense. And I'm going to bet that you can guess what went into the oil that needed to anoint the altar in this whole process before the burning of the incense. You guessed it, myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, all in this one location of Zechariah's task. But that's yet another story in God's overall plan of just revealing who he is and who this Messiah will be. But we have to pick up our story once again so let's jump back to verse 11 and see what comes next. It says there in verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah standing at the right side of this altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. This is amazing. Not only is he handpicked out of that many thousands of priests for this one particular task, but a man who's old and has not yet seen the redemption of Israel and does not yet have a son is hearing an answer to one of those prayers. 
The prayer's been heard. There's a promise given, and it comes with a command. That prayer for a son finally coming true. The promise that it happens miraculously. Elizabeth is beyond those childbearing years. She cannot conceive. They're too old. And yet, she will bear this son. And the command is to give this son the name John, which in Hebrew means Yahweh is gracious. God is gracious or full of favor. It's an indication of who this child will be, this this promise and this answer to a prayer, perhaps long since abandoned by Zechariah and Elizabeth. But more importantly, who is this child John, and what will he become? Well, picking that back up in verse 14, we get that description. The angel says here, John will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. Once again, just filled with all kinds of imagery about exactly who, the promise of this son, John, who he will become to Zechariah, this priest. The fact that he's not to take of wine or fermented drink, again, is a, harkens back to Numbers chapter 6 from the Old Testament, an indication that this John will take what is a, called a Nazarite vow, essentially deems him set apart and devoted to God. It's a a vow that would have been taken perhaps for a short period of time, but in John's case, it will be his entire life. He will be devoted to a task, and that task is to be this forerunner for yet the Lord who would come. It's to prepare the people, and all of this imagery that he uses, talking about the power of Elijah now again harkens back to a prophecy from the book of Malachi. This is the last book you would find in the Old Testament. And in chapters 3 and 4, we see exactly the verses that this angel is using to tell Zechariah who John will become. In Malachi 3.1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. That's who this son John will be. And in chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 in Malachi, he says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents. You see, in the, the prophetic office, like Elijah, one yet is to come, and now it's pointing to John essentially the last and greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He is the one who will come on the scene and pave the way for the Lord to come and to prepare those people to receive the Lord. There's just one interesting note in the book of Malachi that goes on to say a little bit more about this messenger and what will happen in and around that time. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read these words. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. A true sign of judgment. But, verse 2, for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. It's a very important note to hang on to. We can't be sure if Zechariah was aware of all of this. How overwhelmed might he have been to 
maybe not make all the connections to these Old Testament, Old Testament images. But the fact is, and the truth is, John would fulfill the role of this messenger. And in that fulfillment, something about this judgment and then protection would happen very shortly thereafter. So let's recap. We have Zechariah in his task in the temple before God representing the people prayerfully as any priest would enter the temple. This angel, Gabriel, appears to him and gives him this great promise. Along with that promise, reminding him that this was because your prayer was heard and then a command to name this son of yours, John. And this John, he would be that forerunner to who we understand to be the Messiah. Well, there's just one problem with all of this. Zechariah cannot believe it. Let's pick up his story once again. Now in verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. It's a pretty logical thing to say, right? Is he just asking for clarification? Well, let's find out. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Verse 20, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. He simply cannot believe it. And the angel knows that to be the case. It seems fairly unbelievable, doesn't it? That this could be the case, but God is the God of the unimaginable, of the miraculous. And as we said earlier, that prayer of Zechariah probably was, only you can do this, God. Only you can accomplish this. And now that it's coming to pass, Zechariah, unfortunately, doesn't find himself in a position of faith and trust. And so he's made mute in that moment. Poor Zechariah, this unbelief is contrasted with Elizabeth's. Let me read on just a bit further. It says, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah. These are the people outside the temple. And they were wondering, why did he stay so long in the temple? When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. Listen to what she says. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. We have a, a couple now that's torn Zechariah can't believe it, and he's struck mute. Elizabeth believes and gives praise to God. There is something in their story God is going to use to just draw them that much deeper into his overall plan for just who this other son is that he'll be bringing into the world, this Messiah. But here's the, the idea, the key takeaway at this point in their story. God's promises are to be trusted. He's mute, and the text goes out of its way several times to tell us that, to indicate that this was as a result. It was as a consequence of his unbelief. You know, lack of trust in God always has its consequences, but God is always, sometimes desperately, trying to pursue us and show himself to us in order that, not that we would make sense of everything, but that we would just bow down and trust him, have faith in him. 
And that's exactly what God is doing in Zechariah and Elizabeth's story, is calling forth trust, calling forth faith. God has a plan. The angel reminded Zechariah that it would all come true at the appointed time. So when the time is right, God will bring his promises to pass. And from you and I, it'll be just the same. And what he's looking for from you and I is just like what he was looking for from Zechariah is our trust. Well, what we find as we continue with their story is that trusting God does indeed birth obedience. That as we learn to trust God, the obedience follows. What we see later in verses 57 and six through 66 is the whole description of John's birth. This is something that the whole town shows up for. They, they hear about, as the text says, they hear about the mercy that the Lord had shown to Elizabeth. He was the talk of the town. The Lord was being praised because of what he did miraculously in their life. So John is born. The people realize that that's out of God's mercy. And then we see this first great sign of obedience birthed from this growing trust now. Now imagine, Zechariah, we, we flip the page and the story leads to John's birth. But in actuality, there's a nine-month period of silence for Zechariah to do a lot of reflection, to do a lot of growing in trust. And so when the time comes for him to be born, he still, Zechariah, cannot speak. They hand him a tablet for him to write on, and he writes on the tablet, his name will be John. And at that moment, his tongue is loosed, and he is set ablaze with praise for Almighty God. He praises God from his lips, and it's only after he demonstrated that act of obedience. The command was, you shall name him John. And now that trust birthed this obedience designated in this name John that Zechariah gives him indeed. What happens, and this is what I can't wait for us to discover here together, is what Zechariah does next. If you have your Bible, flip over there to verse 68. This is what is often referred to as Zechariah's song. It's something that would have been very poetic, probably would have rolled off his tongue in a way that it sounded like a song or like a psalm from the Old Testament. And we're told that this is not only a song, but this is a Holy Spirit-filled prophecy that in that moment, his tongue is loosed, he's praising God, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and he sings and says far more than I think he ever realized was a part of this entire promise through his son, John. Let me read for us those verses, uh, starting in verse 68. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Do you see the salvation that he's proclaiming? The redemption of God's people, Israel? This prayer, no doubt, that Zechariah had for so long, an old man fearing that he may never see that day is now singing and prophesying as if it has already happened 
God has done this. He has visited. He has redeemed. He has saved. And did you notice he did it all by his mercy that he has shown throughout the ages to their ancestors. He's true to that Abrahamic covenant. He's true to that Davidic covenant. And that means there will be a ruler. There will be a king for them. And the government will exist under his rule, not under Roman rule. Zechariah, it's as if he's seeing it come alive before his very eyes, seeing it fulfilled even before it happens. It shows us that God is a God of promise. He's a God who saves. When that trust births obedience, it's not just for obedience sake. It's so that we would then build relationship with God, which is exactly what he wants with Zechariah and Elizabeth from their trust. He wants their trust because he wants them to see how much he loves them. And out of his mercy, he is saving them. He's protecting them. And he's going to use their son, John, in one of the most miraculous events of history of all time in bringing the Messiah into this world. So God He is a God of promise, and he's to be experienced. But as that angel said, God's promises come to pass at their appointed time. It's yet another key idea that it took nine months for Zechariah to realize. Zechariah, he can finally speak as if it's already happened. But let's continue and see what else we learn about this God from the end of Zechariah's song, picking it back up here in verse 76. Now he turns his attention to who this son of his will be. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Do you see here, once again, God is a God of tender mercy, the text says this time. It's the basis for his salvation. And this unique role that John will get to play in this is that he is the forerunner to prepare God's people for this very redemption message that will come with the Messiah, that will come with this rising sun. And that knowledge is of the forgiveness of their sins. That's the knowledge of their salvation. John has a very special part to play in this. John is the forerunner. Jesus is the fulfillment The Lord bringing salvation through the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of God. That, my friends, is the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do, is to demonstrate this tender mercy of who God is, to bring forgiveness of sins, to bring that salvation. And it calls for trust. Now, do you remember that prophecy from Malachi I told you to hang on to? from chapter four. I want us to go back to that for a moment. Malachi chapter four, verse two, let me remind you. It said there, but for you who revere my name, ah, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. Do you see the connection here once again? between what Zechariah is prophesying, he's also mentioning this rising sun right here in what we just read together. Let me read that once again. It's John who will be the forerunner before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people that knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins, once again, because of the tender mercy of our God, And here it is, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in 
darkness. So what is all of this about this rising sun? What, all, what is all of this about shining a light on those who are in darkness? Remember, this is a Holy, spilled, a Holy Spirit-filled prophecy. This is something that is beyond John's knowledge to put all of the pieces together. But God is putting the pieces together. God is weaving their story. And the Messiah and John are key in this story for Zechariah and Elizabeth to understand. Where else do we see this image of a rising sun, of a light shining on those who are in darkness? It's right back where we started. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 and following. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who this Messiah will be. He will bring this salvation through the forgiveness of sins. He will embody these characteristics of his everlasting father. So imagine this with me, if you will. Here's Zechariah holding his newborn son in his arms as he's singing and prophesying this great reality that God has showed him through the Holy Spirit. We have God as everlasting father of his people, Israel, looking at his son, Zechariah, who's looking at his promised son, John, now learning that there will be yet another son, and he will be that rising sun to shine that light on those living in darkness. He will be the one to bring salvation. He will be the one to embody everything about this everlasting God. Folks, this is the takeaway for us. We can trust God's tender mercy to bring to pass every promise because he will do it when the time is right. This is who our God is. He's our everlasting father. He loves you. He cares for you. And he protects you. And his promises always come to pass when the time is right. I pray that you realize how he's doing it in your story. Because just as he was weaving a story through Zechariah and Elizabeth about the Messiah, we are woven into the same salvation story. I hope this Advent season, you don't miss the reality of that truth. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the way that you reveal yourself to this world. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to merit it. But Lord, out of your love, out of your decision to reveal to us who you are, you demonstrate that you are this everlasting father. You send your son Jesus with this name to demonstrate and embody everything about your character to this world, to us. Help us, just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, to arrive at this perfect place of trust. Because we know, Lord, your tender mercy will cause your promises to come to pass when the time is right. And all you want from us is our trust. We pray all of this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen.